has anybody ever, uh, you know, preferably came off the, the porch with a shotgun and, you know, and said, <laughs> what, what are you doing? No, I, or, I had, uh, I had one incident, uh, Welcome to the Exploring Washington State podcast. Here's your host, Scott Cowan. Well, my guest today is Brian Jennings. And I first found out about Brian because Brian was sharing some of his photography on our Facebook group. And I liked what I was seeing. I went to his website. I reached out and we ended up having a nice conversation about, well, Brian's a native of of Washington, well, originally from Washington State. And we're going to talk about all that. But Brian, I, you know, we found you through photography. So yeah. why don't you start this off and say, how'd you get involved in photography? Because that wasn't your corporate career gig, right? No, it really wasn't. It was, uh, <laughs> I had an interest in it. Um, I had been doing uh, some TV at the end of my career for a Central Oregon group uh, called Zolo Media. And Zolo Media had several uh, TV stations and they asked me if I would do some great outdoor reports they had seen some of my writing in a weekly, and of course, they heard me on radio uh, uh, many places, KXL in Portland, um, uh, up in Seattle, KVI, King, and so forth over All the right. years. So uh, I said, sure, that would be fun. And uh, it, what it did was force me back into a, uh, an interest that I had, and that was photography. Um, I had to be able to show images. I had a great cameraman. But uh, with that said, uh, I was always with a camera at that point. Uh, I I was taking a lot of B-roll for him while he was doing the main focus of the reports. And these were four to five minute reports, each one per week. And uh, so we did a lot of photography, videography, and it just got me interested in uh, grabbing some beautiful things again because we were outdoors and it was wonderful. Now, that was in Oregon and you know, we, you're back up in Washington. My understanding is that you were born and raised in Washington. That's right. And then mm-hmm. corporate life moved you around a little bit, but now you're back. And I guess, can we call you retired? Is that a, is that a fair word to use? Yeah. Uh, tired okay. for sure. Tired. Uh, okay. <laughs> no, uh, retired is, is a good word. And yes, I have been for about oh, two and a half years now. And, okay. Uh, so every day is Saturday and, you know, yesterday was Saturday and we went up to Port Townsend and it just goofed around. And <laughs> well, let's, let me ask you, let me, let me put you on the spot. What did you guys do in Port Townsend? Cause that's a beautiful town. That's, that's such a, before we settled in Wenatchee, that was on our radar of places to kind of get away mm-hmm. from the Seattle Tacoma traffic. We were thinking, Oh, Port Townsend. So yeah. Yeah. what did you guys do up there yesterday? Well, was- it is a it's special town and uh, they have wonderful restaurants. I was meeting with a long lost friend for lunch a long <clears throat> excuse me <clears throat> um a long i i had to clear out the old throat here uh i used to have a voice <laughs> <laughs> uh, we were meeting with a long lost friend who um i haven't seen in 60 years and uh he was a a boyhood friend of mine when i was very young and our mothers were best of friends and we would get together. Uh, I lived on a farm and in, in, in Spokane area, north of Spokane. And he would come out and we would, he would stay the night. We would do farm boy things uh, when we were just really, really young. And so we got onto a path in, in education by junior high. We were in different school districts and, and um, uh, we just got, <clears throat> we lost touch uh, in life. And so um, we, uh, we found each other through Facebook. And um, <laughs> for about the last year and said, hey, we have to get together. So we finally did yesterday. Well, see, that's one of the things. I mean, Facebook, gets kind of a lot of people, you know, we turn our nose up at it and blah, mm-hmm. blah, blah. But there's this element of being able to reconnect with people from our pasts that, in your case, 60 years. Yeah. I, yeah, I went to an event last weekend uh, from somebody I met through Facebook, a musician, and they were having a festival. So we went to Ording. Mm-hmm. And I'm there and we're talking to the musician and he goes, Scott, I'd like to introduce you to Alan. And, and I look at Alan and Alan looks at me and goes, I go, 
I think we worked together like 30 years ago. <laughs> and he's like, oh my gosh, you know, and it was just, you know, so that wasn't directly Facebook, but it was kind of a byproduct of it. Yeah, And it's yeah. really quite fascinating that you can connect with people from 30, 60 years ago mm-hmm. and, um, and then get out and, you know, be social again. So that's, that's wonderful. So what else? So let's talk about Port Townsend just because you were there yesterday. What do you find special about Port Townsend? What is it that, I mean, from a photography standpoint, where do you like to go and create photo, you know, pho- photographic images, if you will, um, in Port Townsend? Well, um, one thing is the, uh, the ferry dock, uh, the ferry terminal. And if you get up there on a, on a hill bluff overlooking downtown Port Townsend, uh, you see the ferry coming in and out over the, uh, downtown brick buildings, those mm-hmm. antiquated buildings. Yes. And, uh, that is a beautiful, beautiful sight. Uh, I have it both coming and going. And if you get it in different conditions with fog, with uh, the sun coming up uh, from the morning, mm-hmm. uh, you can get some wonderful images. And then if you just uh, go downtown, the old buildings themselves, I mean, it, it's not too often that you see uh, advertising of uh, yesteryear on the side of buildings, Bull Durham, uh, the old uh, tobacco Right. Uh, purveyor uh, is prevalent on one of those buildings. You see that in the uh, Palouse area as well in some of the towns like St. John's and Palouse itself. Um, so it's it's a throwback. It's a throwback to yesteryear. And um, and then the people. Uh, I mean, there's unbelievable situations with uh, street photography there. Um, they have a wonderful harbor. Um, the harbor itself is is spectacular, and you can just go on and on and on and on. You have the uh, uh, <clears throat> the lighthouse area, which is terrific. Uh, you can go over there, and also I would say Fort Warden, which is you know just a mile away. Uh, of right. course, that was where the uh, uh, the movie uh, uh, what the gentleman. Officer and a gentleman. Officer and gentleman was filmed. Mm-hmm. And you can get yes. up there in the quad. Um, <clears throat> that is a really good place to film, uh, to photograph uh, in the fall. There are so many beautiful, beautiful uh, scenes up there. So that's um, that's kind of what I've done up in Port Townsend. Okay. So let's go back because you've got – so one of the things we'd, we had talked about with some of your photography, and so you'd, you've done some some amazing stuff in the Palouse – which being a West side guy originally, I mean, I grew up, I spent the vast majority of my life living on the West side of the Cascades. I went to college in Ellensburg and I now live in Wenatchee, but Mm -hmm. so I maybe spent seven, eight years over here in in Eastern central Washington. The, you kind of, you know, the perception that I had, which was wrong. I'll, I'll, I'll acknowledge that because I don't want the people from Spokane to send me more hate mail like they did in one of the episodes. Um, it was pretty funny. I said something. <clears> and Spokane I'm from Spokane. So you're, you're I know. You're pretty not careful. I know. But, well, but see, growing up, see, growing up in the 70s, yeah. Spokane had this stigma attached to it on, in at least in my shallow, small West Side world. I mean, it was over there. It was just out there. It wasn't part of us. So I had this poorly conceived notion that Spokane was meh. Mm -hmm. Spokane's actually becoming one of my favorite places to go. I I enjoy going to Spokane now. Yeah. But I've always, I've always thought I had this notion that Eastern Washington was barren and flat and that's simply wrong. Mm -hmm. And, and I'm looking, I'm on your website right now and I'm looking at some of your Palouse prints and it's anything but flat. It's mm-hmm. visually stunning and it's phenomenal. So as a photographer, how do you go about capturing these, these images? Because when I drive through, when you're on the road, it, you, you, I, when you're on the road, it doesn't seem like this magnificent, but your, your shots are more, are, I don't know if they're aerial or if you've just found a higher point that you're shooting down on. I'm looking at one and it's not named but it's um it's 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 you know i understand that what you're driving at because when i first got into photography 
uh, I found the same thing. I said, well, where can I get great shots? Everybody can see it from the main road. You have to get off the, uh, the beaten track and mm-hmm. you have to take that, that dirt road, uh, with a sign that says, uh, there are no signs from here on out <laughs> primitive road. <laughs> and you just have to be brave enough to follow them. Okay. And, uh, so that's, that's one of the, uh, the tricks that I use and, and I pour over maps a lot. Okay. Uh, both uh, online and uh, and paper maps as well. <laughs> um, I talk to farmers. Uh, really? Yeah, you know, I, I I will find a farmer and just talk to them, and and they generally will warm up to me because I'm a farm kid. And, okay. Uh, and I'm usually a little bit older than they are uh, now, okay. and they understand that you know he he probably saw the farming days back in the, you know when when it was really right, and. Uh, so you warm up to them in that way and you get to know uh, places that uh, that otherwise, uh, unless you take the time, you won't find. So it's a it's a it's a quest. It's an investigation. It's uh, well, what's around here and what what does that old barn represent? Who owned that? Um, in, in the case of one barn down uh, south of Pullman, the Weber barn. Um, the guy who, uh, tends the farm now came out and, and greeted me and we talked for about a half an hour and he gave me the history of it and says, okay, now go take your pictures and enjoy it. So generally you just, uh, you handshake, look them in the eye and then they trust you. Um, <clears throat> some photographers don't do that. And, uh, and they will tread upon land trespass and, and it really gives us a bad name. Plus it shuts down a lot of photo ops. Mm-hmm. Uh, for the future. So um, tread lightly and uh, be a human being. So, shake their hand, look them in the eye. I bet you've got some stories though, about not just that the Weber barn, but what, how about put you on the spot, share another story about, you know, you're, you're up there on a, the primitive road and you, you find, you know, you find a farm and you want to, you know, explore it a little bit more. Cause it looks like it might have a good photo op from it. Mm-hmm. Has anybody ever, uh, you know, preferably came off the, the porch with a shotgun and, and said, <laughs> what, what are you doing? No, I, or, I had uh, I had one incident uh, somewhat like that in Leavenworth one time, not in the city itself, but <clears throat> in the uh, Tumwater Canyon. And there was a beautiful barn and uh, it was off the side of the road quite a distance. Um, and there were no markers, <clears throat> excuse me, there were no markers whatsoever and no fence line. And so I walked about a hundred feet into, uh, off the road and into a grassy knoll area. And there was a farmer there and he says, it's private property. And I said, Oh, it's not marked. And gosh, I'm sorry. Um, uh, and I immediately, uh, apologized and left and he came back and says, that's okay. He says, you're right. It isn't marked. And he says, if you want to take a picture, go for it. And, uh, and I said, I should have known. He says, well, that's okay. It wasn't marked. You're right. So um, you try to avoid those situations. And I always look if there's a fence line, if there's a trespassing sign, a no trespassing sign, uh, I do not uh, cross that line. Yeah. And that's that's pretty wise. So the photo that I'm still looking at is entitled Evening Shadows in the Palouse um, with, and with the images taken near sunset at Steptoe Butte. Mm-hmm. For those people that might be listening to this that are kind of gearheads, what gear were you using when you when you took that shot? I, I on your website you 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 state that you use Sony mirrorless cameras. Mm-hmm. So, what what model Sony are you typically shooting with right I now? I use a Sony A seven R Mark II, okay. and uh, it's a mirrorless camera. Of uh, it's a beautiful camera. Being mirrorless, it's a little more lightweight. Uh, than a than a, a normal camera that is not mirrorless. Um, it's a uh, camera that gives you 42 megapixels resolution, which okay. is higher than most cameras. And uh, <clears throat> some other cameras are starting to catch up. Uh, uh, Canon and and uh, Nikon have both gotten into the mirrorless arena, and uh, they're all great cameras. So with 42 megapixels, what that means is I could crop it down if I need to, and I'm still getting a great resolution picture with very little noise in it, if any. 
And it just gives you a lot of latitude uh, to uh, to take great uh, resolution pictures. Now, the picture you're looking at is not cropped whatsoever. And okay. um, and it's it's a huge picture. So if it were printed out, it would be just beautiful. Uh, it would carry every pixel and every little tiny nook and, nook and cranny of that picture. Mm-hmm. And uh, so that's that's why I use. And the other reason I use Sony is because um, <clears throat> when I was in radio, I always had a Sony recorder and Sony recorders never let me down with audio. And so I just yeah, Sony's a good product for me. Uh, that's the reason I use Sony. Did you use their. Um, bef- before you went mirrorless, were you using Sony camera bodies there? There are other series of cameras. You know, I started out, yes, I I started out with a, a basically an entry level Nikon, um, Mm -hmm. the D 3000 model, they call it. Okay. And it's a really good camera. It's a moderately priced camera. It's about 500 bucks. Uh, it's, uh, and a lot of people say, if I'm getting into photography, what would you suggest? I suggest that, uh, Nikon D uh, 3300 now. (laughs) <laughs> yep. And uh, it's a great camera to learn. And I used that for about two years uh, before I decided to go ahead and upgrade uh, to a Sony. And um, uh, not saying that Nikon isn't as good as Sony, they are. Um, <clears throat> there's very little difference between uh, the major uh, manufacturers of cameras anymore. It's just a preference. Well, it's like I use the analogy of like uh, we, we both are driving pickup trucks. You have a Ford F-150 and I have a Chevy 1500. Right. They're both reliable transportation. It'll get us from point A to point B. Uh, the knobs and dials are a little different mm-hmm. on the Ford than they are the Chevy. So once you get used to it, you're you're able to go. I have both Sony and Nikon gear mm-hmm. and I'm inept. I'm completely inept with both. It doesn't matter what brand. I can mess it up. That's so. Right. Yeah. You know, what are you using? So what do you use for, um, photo processing? Are you using, uh, are you using Lightroom and Photoshop? Or yeah, I, I use else? Lightroom and Photoshop. I have used okay. other, um, uh, software as well. I uh, started out with using a uh, cyber link, uh, photo <laughs> director. Okay. And you know what? Uh, it's, it's a great product. Yeah, It, it really is a great product. Uh, I used that primarily in, in editing video, and then I uh, uh, bought one of the uh, uh, photo uh, software applications as well. And it's it's a lot like uh, Lightroom, although I found Lightroom to be a little easier and, um, and, and more possibilities in it. And so <clears throat> I graduated over to Lightroom, oh gosh, about uh, two years ago. And, uh, it's, it's the best application period for any photographer, for any uh, pro photographer, you have to have Lightroom and you have to have know a certain amount of, of Photoshopping, uh, applications as well. Although I must say, I rarely use Photoshop. I just don't like to use Photoshop, uh, unless I'm doing a specially focused, um, uh, picture or, or something like that. Right. Well, in keeping with our, you know, if you haven't figured out, we're going to bounce around a lot. Um, but in keeping with our Palouse theme right now at the moment, I'm, I'm taking a look at a couple of shots that you've done of, you know, uh, Palouse Falls, which is an mm-hmm. incredibly well, well-documented, well-known uh, place in Washington. But I'm looking at one, let me see, is it, it's, um, you just have it titled Palouse Falls of Washington's official waterfall, but it's kind of looking straight on at the falls Mm -hmm. where were you positioned to get that shot that's really right at the main entry area uh in the parking lot if you just park and walk 100 feet right down to the uh the fence Mm -hmm. uh, you can get any number of shots right there and um and that's where most uh, people go actually Uh, but the one that uh, you can see the the river running uh, back down beyond yes. the falls is further up on a knoll that you have to climb up on and you have to get within about six feet of the precipice, uh, precipice. and it, it's scary. It is really, really scary. Uh, I, I put my tripod as high as I could get it. So number one, I didn't have to look down 
<laughs> Sorry, I'm, and, I'm, I'm laughing because I wouldn't go six feet to the edge. So yeah. uh, and, uh, and there are warning signs up there. And I saw a lot of uh, photographers get much closer than I did. And there's no way, no way. No. So, do you ever use, do you ever do anything with a drone? Uh, you know, I used to, but I, I finally, um, I, I owned three different drones in my day and I love mm -hmm. them. And, um, but unless you want, uh, the, the best resolution, the best photography in the world, you have to spend a lot of money, uh, yes. on a drone situation. I I'm talking 10, $15,000 or more. Mm -hmm. And um, I just came to the conclusion that it's fun, but uh, I want the best photography that I can get with my my Sony camera. And a drone mm -hmm. isn't going to do that for me. And so I, I made the choice that, no, I'm not going to do that. Plus, <clears throat> I found, and, you know, you want to be really, really respectful of the use of a drone. You can't fly them in wilderness areas. People do. You can't, you can fly them over a wilderness you can fly into it, but you can't set down. So you have to be at the boundary. Uh, there mm -hmm. are many places where, where drones are banned, um, mm -hmm. bird sanctuaries, on and on and on. And I can understand that. Plus, I, right. I, I got nervous of flying drones over crowded situations of people and so forth. So I just said, you know, not for me, not for me. Uh, and I, I'll stick I'll, you know, my two feet on the ground. I completely agree. So, so this is a, a, a something I haven't seen before, and not that I've seen everything, but I I'm looking at a photo entitled "Round Barn" mm -hmm. in St. John in St. John, Washington. Mm -hmm. By chance, I've never seen a barn structure that looks like this. By chance, do you know anything about the structure mm -hmm. other than its well, to me, were, very distinctive look? Yeah, um, uh, there's a history behind the round barn. They were popular from about 1900 to till about 1920, 1930. And the reason was, is because they were cheaper to build. It took less oh. wood and the foundations were, were easier uh, to handle. But what the round barn did was it presented the farmer uh, efficiency in the use of it, especially with the, their cattle. So they could, in the round, the, the con conical structure in the middle, they would put the hay. And the hay then would be forced down and coming out of the uh, conical structure, there were numerous stalls that would face toward that. And so oh. the cattle themselves would be head in to the center of the barn. And there's all, also one practical uh, thing about that as well. Cows and manure. Well, they do their job out of the barn out to the edge of the barn, make it an easier for the farmer to gather it and to get it out of the barn and to disseminate oh. it. Now, if they were wandering around the barn in any kind of direction and so forth, you have a mess, especially right. if a cow is on green grass. And, okay. you know, good luck there. So it was kind of smart in that regard. Um, yeah, uh, you know, we I wouldn't <laughs> say it on the air here or anything, but, you know, when a cow does its number, <laughs> Uh, it's pointing outward, and it's just a lot easier. Uh, they had their wheelbarrows right there on the round edge, and and they could scoop it up, and uh, away they go. But if you have, you know, 50, huh. 50 cattle mingling inside of a shed, <laughs> there's no way <laughs> that they're going to point out for the convenience of the farmer. Well, see, I'm glad I asked that question because that's <laughs> not the direction I thought. No, I mean, I, that's the beautiful thing about doing this is I learn something every single episode. And if that's the only thing I learned in this episode, well, so be it. But now I have you know why they used round barns. Yeah. Well, let's, you grew up north of Spokane. And so I've, I've bounced over to your Spokane area prints. Mm -hmm. And this is where, you know, I, I have to, you know, it, it, once again, uh, confess my, uh, incorrect information about Spokane, but I am, I am looking at a photo and I cannot make it tell me what, oh, there it is. Duncan Gardens. I've never heard of Duncan Gardens. This shot is absolutely stunning. What can you tell us about Duncan Gardens? Well, Duncan Gardens is the uh, centerpiece of Manitou Park, which is on the okay. South Hill of Spokane. 
It's up about 21st and uh, Grand Avenue. And uh, being from the area, I know it really well. Um, it's a very historic park. Uh, it's one of the prettiest, uh, I think, um, underrated parks anywhere in the world. Uh, I, I would put it on the scale of uh, the Bouchard Gardens almost in, in Victoria. And wow. uh, uh, it's, it's just a magnificent, magnificent park. Um, I, uh, you know, for me, it was a childhood thing. I used to go there as a young man and, and a teenager. And, and so whenever I go back to Spokane, I always like to drive through to see what's happening there. They have a wonderful rose garden as well, a Japanese garden that is to die for. Um, it's a really, really, really amazing park. Um, so not that you are the not that you're the spokesman for Manitou, but about how big is that park? Oh gosh, I would say <clears throat> twenty acres. Okay, so it's a good sized park. Yeah, it's it's a very big park. Okay. And that, okay. that might be a little bit big, but yeah, it's it's right in there. Okay. And so then I am looking at some riverside footbridge photos. Mm-hmm. Where where on the Spokane River is this? that is north. It's up by the old Joe Alby Stadium um, oh, okay. area. I haven't heard that name in so long. Yeah. Um, oh my gosh. That's um, it's Riverside uh, Riverside State Park, and um, it's it's a it's the bowling pitcher that is so famous up there. And there's a there's a bridge that goes across the river that is uh, famous a, a drawbridge, a suspension type bridge. Um, it's, it's a wonderful place to picnic with your kids, uh, with family and friends. It's just a really wonderful, wonderful park. It's one of my favorite state parks in Washington. Okay. And this is, a, so this photograph I'm looking at, you've got it titled Spokane Radio Tower. Mm-hmm. And so I, I, I have a feeling based on your secondary description, you're going to have a story here. So it, you said, although now a commercial station. This was one of the earliest non-commercial station, stations licensed in the U.S. So, do you know the history of that? Uh, a little bit. Uh, it, you, when I knew the station, it was KSPO uh, in Spokane. Okay. And now it, uh, I think it broadcasts a, a, a business uh, format. Um, but early on, uh, I think it was licensed to North Central High School or Lewis and Clark High School, one of the two. And okay. it was uh, the very, very first um, uh, kind of a public radio station licensed to a, a school. And they taught classes uh, uh, to their kids, to the students uh, about being in radio. <clears throat> and so uh, it has that heritage um, the tower itself, right downtown Spokane, um, right on top of a building. And it just presented, you know, me being in radio for 51 years. Um, it presented an opportunity for me to be able to uh, grab it on, on uh, as a photograph uh, because it presented so many great red flashing colors and so forth. <laughs> and, you know, I just like it. It's just uh, part of my heritage, basically. How did you... Totally jumping off your photography, but how did you get started in radio? What was the path that got you? Because you said you were a farm kid north of Spokane. <laughs> mm-hmm. Was radio something you wanted to do as a as a kid, or well, um, you, it, when I look there? back at it, uh, I think it was kind of predestined. Um, uh, when I was a, a very young uh, child, eleven, ten. Uh, we had a neighbor uh, farmer who um, I respected and I was, you know, <clears throat> looked up to. And he built crystal radio sets. And okay. uh, so he built one for me. And I ran the uh, antenna wire outside my bedroom window clear out to the barn, about 200 feet. <sighs> okay. And so here I was laying in bed at night listening to radio stations all over North America. And it was fascinating. I would listen to Dallas. I would listen to Montreal. Uh, wow. It was, it was a really amazing. Uh, and so I, I, I didn't know. I just loved it. <clears throat> Later on, uh, when I went to college, I went to Pacific Lutheran in Tacoma. 
And okay. uh, PLU had an on-campus radio station, KPLU, back in the day. The call letters have now changed. And um, <clears throat> during my um, freshman year, uh, one of my roommates said, let's go take a look at the radio station. And this was in March of 1968. I was a freshman. Okay. And okay. I absolutely fell in love with it. I said, oh, wow, this is right here on campus. And uh, so I started investigating, and it was part of the speech and communications department. And there, uh, uh, the dean was uh, uh, Professor uh, Ted Carl, and uh, his uh, main mate uh, with the radio division, and they were doing a little bit of TV as well, was Judd Doughty. <clears throat> and so uh, I became friends with Judd, and uh, he guided me through a, a course. Uh, by the time I was a senior, um, I was able to uh, do an internship at then KTAC radio. Oh my God. I grew up in Tacoma. Yeah. I grew up in Tacoma. Okay. And uh, Steve West was the uh, program director of the station at the time. This was 1970. Okay. And so I completed my very last course at uh, PLU was a one month internship. And I wrote the paper and I've turned it in. And that was in January of 1971. And I graduated with that ahead of my class. <clears throat> well, a few months later, the program director, Steve West, moved to Spokane and program KJRB, my hometown station. And he called me and says, we have a, a news opening. And I said, I want it. And so I went back home and, and uh, started my radio career basically there. And uh, from that, it led me to KXL in Portland, KJR in Seattle. It was all the same company. Uh, K Smith uh, radio and Danny K was the owner operator. And right. uh, so it was, it was a good time and great times for radio. Because, you know, I've heard of KGRB, but never listened to, cause like I said, I was a West side kid. So you, I grew up five miles from PLU. So I grew up right in that neighborhood, mm -hmm. KPLU that, you know, had that great jazz station. Yeah. In the, in the, okay. I don't know if I was playing jazz in the late sixties. or No, we actually we were playing rock and roll. I was okay. a station yeah. manager and I could do what I wanted. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Well, I'm going to ask this question then. So it's late sixties, early seventies. What were you playing on KPLU? <clears throat> Smokey Robinson and the miracles. Okay. Um, war. Um, okay. <laughs> all kinds of, you know, uh, almost counterculture type <clears throat> type of things, uh, type of music. And, uh, and then we did a lot of news around the campus and it was always fun. We were huh. always interviewing people around campus and what are you doing and what are you, and what's your story? And yeah, it was a great huh. way to, to learn, uh, to be a communicator and to be in radio. It, you know, it began my career. And, uh, so I owe, uh, and, and 51 years, I made a living doing right. radio. So would you, but so you, were you on the air at KJR in Seattle? Um, I, I did never did worked at KJR. I knew Pat O'Day okay. really well. Pat O'Day was okay. the, <clears throat> the main name there because right. he was part of our community. I had been hired by Pat, uh, to be a news anchor. Um, and then our regional program director got word of it and he came to my <laughs> office at KXL in Portland and says, you do not want to take that job. And I looked at him, I said, it's the dream job. It's everybody's dream job. <clears throat> Excuse me. He, and he said, there's a reason for that. He said, the station is going to be sold and you will not repeat that to anybody. And so the oh. station was sold and it was sold to a different company and they changed everything. And, and, you know, uh, it wasn't the culture that we were used to, um, in K Smith radio at all. So I stayed at KXL and I had a wonderful career there. I spent 20 years at KXL and, uh, it's the foundation of my, my journalism by far, um, and so uh, that was a good call. And I appreciate Mel Bailey, bless his heart, uh, for keeping me in Portland. Why do I know that name? <clears throat> no, he was a great radio person in Portland uh, himself, oh. uh, KEX radio. He programmed that radio station. But um, <clears throat> not going to KJR didn't mean that I didn't come to Seattle. And, mm -hmm. uh, and several years later, I was recruited by King Broadcasting. I went there for three years and then I went over to KVI 
And um, we established what then was thought to be and still is um, the first uh, all conservative talk lineup in America. And so, yeah, a lot of people will hate that. Other people will love it. Uh, whatever. Um, I was the guy that did that. <laughs> you were, you were, so you were the guy we can either praise you or throw rocks mm, at and you. You yeah, were the guy. Either way. <laughs> yep. Okay. It was radio. Wow. It was radio. And there's only mm-hmm. one reason to be in radio and that is to garner ratings and garner the, the absolute most advertising revenue from those ratings possible. And you do formats that work. And this mm-hmm. format presented itself uh, to work at the time. And it did. It was gangbusters. We went from number 23 in the ratings to number one. And it was a magnificent ride. And it put me on the map. <clears throat> and uh, all of a sudden, I was traveling all over the United States, helping other radio stations do the same. Wow. Okay. So now you may want to end the interview because you know what I did. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> no, I see. But see, I, I, I find it fascinating to hear business stories. Mm-hmm. And so just the facts of what you just shared was KVI was the 23rd rated station. Right. I didn't know that Seattle had 23 stations, oh, so gosh, it wasn't. Yeah. <clears throat> they have yeah. 30, 40. Okay, but so you were still lower third the you know the kvi was not setting the world on fire. if you're not in the top five in the yeah. key demographics uh your revenues are not nearly what they should be and so you have to break that top five especially 25 54 adults and mm-hmm. uh, and once you're in that category then you are getting agency money all over the united states and it makes a huge difference in your uh, your profitability and what a station yes. can do. <clears throat> you can hire more news people. You can hire more producers um, uh, when you reach that goal. And <clears throat> so it's it's just it's a it's a it's a uh, it's a benchmark. It's right. a benchmark for all radio stations. And so, I mean, here. So just from the, the nuts and bolts of it. You took a, a struggling station and you you grew it to number one in the market. And sales a big market. I mean, nationally, it's yeah. Uh, then know. it was the uh, twelfth largest market in yeah. the country. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So that's that's a quite a quite a turnaround, and uh, that's that's absolutely fascinating to me. We could go down that rabbit hole the rest of the interview, but I'm going to kind of reel myself back in and and just say, let's talk photography, and I'm going to put you on the spot. I'm going to give you two correct. Well, any answer is correct, but I'm going to give you two options to the question. West of the mountains, east of the mountains. Okay. Mm -hmm. Your next photography trip, where do you want to go? West of the, west of the Cascades and east of the Cascades. East. I am, I'm, I'm heading east for, um, uh, uh, for great opportunities um, primarily with dry falls, um, area, Cooley dam area. Uh, okay. I'm going to go back to Spokane, uh, in August and, uh, go to some places that I know are, are really, uh, great in August, uh, by green bluff and so forth. Some barns I want to be able to get. So spoke, you're going to go back to, so you're in August, you're going North of Spokane barns. Mm-hmm and that you want to take. All right. So, um, and then in the fall, um, I have a trip lined up for the grand Tetons and, uh, Yellowstone. And okay. so I'll be going through a lot of Montana, uh, Wyoming, Idaho, and, uh, that'll be about a two, two and a half week trip altogether. Uh, oh, should okay. hit it right at the right time with a peak of foliage. Should be just wonderful. All right. So now your next Western Washington trip that you want to take, mm. what would, what would that be for Western Washington? Where, where do you like to go? I mean, I'm looking at a photograph here mm-hmm. of, of Mount Rainier of uh, reflection Lake, which is, you know, iconic. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, but what maybe give us an under, well, you don't want to tell us your secret photo shots, but you know, where's an underappreciated part of Western Washington, in your opinion, for photography opportunities? Well, um, <clears throat> it depends on how much time you have, but um, 
<clears throat> one of my favorite places is to head for the beaches, uh, Rialto, Ruby Beach, uh, and those areas um, on the peninsula. And fall is a good time uh, to do that. Anything around Puget Sound, uh, summer-wise, is wonderful. We have great sunset opportunities here and, yeah. um, and great sunrise opportunities. So <clears throat> keep in mind where you want to be able to you know, have a, a foreground and where the sun comes up, where the sun goes down. And uh, you can get many, many opportunities uh, uh, that way. So I would say anywhere from uh, Gig Harbor uh, north to Port Townsend, uh, make your way over Crescent Lake, go to Ruby Beach, go to Second Beach, um, and uh, go to the whole rainforest. Um, one of my favorite areas, but the best time to see that and, and to photograph that is in the early spring. Uh, mm -hmm. when you're getting more moisture. So, <clears throat> you know, the, the opportunities are, are absolutely endless. I, um, I just get up in the morning and say, Hey, uh, and what do I want to do? And, and, uh, and the other thing is, is that, that good photographers, uh, will photograph early in the morning and then into the evening, the best opportunities for colorful light. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so you have to, uh, uh, plan that in. Um, <clears throat> so in other words, you take long naps in the middle of the day. Right. That's one of the reasons why I'm probably never going to be a good photographer. <laughs> is this, the whole golden hour, chasing the golden hour just doesn't work in my sleep schedule. Yeah, for yeah. me. No, but I, it, but you're absolutely correct. <laughs> I, you know, I'm looking at a, a photo that you took at Port Ledlow on the golf course mm -hmm. and you know, it's, you've got the light hitting um, past the green, yeah, the sunlight's getting there, and yeah. you've got the the flowers in bloom in front, right in the forefront. But the question I have about that photograph is: Are you a golfer, or did you just go out there to be a photographer that day? No, I went out to be a photographer that day. Uh, I do okay. golf, but not not that often, and I'm horrible. <clears throat> so, well, I was just going to say, if if it were me taking that shot, and you know, you you know. I, that's where the ball would be. I would have been in the rough and just, just yeah. Just, okay. yeah. Well, <clears throat> I, um, I, I enjoy golf and I enjoy playing with good friends, but, uh, it's, it's not a passion of mine. Photography is a passion. I'm just, I mean, I'm going through all of these and wow, that's a beautiful shot. And it, we don't, we don't talk about Canada too much on the show cause it's Washington state, but there's a, Cor a Cordona Lake. Wow. That's uh, oh that's yeah, beautiful. that's up in uh, that's the British Columbia Rockies. Yeah, I was. Yeah, it's, up, it's absolutely beautiful. Up on a, um, a twenty mile in to the wilderness on horseback, and so wow. very okay. very few people will see that shot, uh, that mountain and the lake uh, at any time in any year. Uh, mm -hmm. You just don't have that. Twenty people may see that in a year's time. So when we were scheduling this, you were taking a trip down to, I think to Mount St. Helens. I did. That in my yeah. Okay. And I'm looking on your, on your site. Is this Mount St. Helens shot? Is this new? Like from that trip yes. or is this? Yes. So this is very recent. Yeah, this shot. yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Early morning. So, you know, the, early morning. this is an audio show, so it's hard to paint that visual picture, but I'm looking at some, some wildflowers and then we're looking mm -hmm. up at, at where the crater uh, where the mountain blew and it blew the walls off about how far away from the mountain were you when you took this shot? Um, <clears throat> if you were there, um, when it erupted and took that picture, <laughs> you would have about 90 <laughs> seconds to live. Yeah. <laughs> mm, okay. Mm. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, within two miles. Okay. Yeah. Cause that's, that's, the detail of the mountain is um, it's really impressive because I just zoomed in on it. And yeah, that's uh, yeah. it really is amazing uh, to see the mountain at that level. And uh, the eruption itself uh, was a 500 mile an hour blast. And it was oh, sideways wow. where I took that picture. It came right over where I took that picture. And mm. there was old growth timber right there. 150, 200 years old, um, 200 feet tall. 
And it took those, those like matchsticks, blew them right off the ground and uh, deposited them three miles away in another valley. So that's how powerful that blast was. You know, I mean, <clears throat> okay. Yeah, it was amazing. It really was. And I, and I, I, did, not, I, was at, I did not know that. I was at uh, KXL Radio at the time, and of course I covered the, the eruption 24-7, as did all the Seattle stations. And uh, so uh, going back there and seeing that, uh, I hadn't been back in oh, 20 years at least. And okay. to see what, what's occurring with the foliage and the growth and the return to nature is really, uh, really interesting and fun to see. Absolutely. I, I'm just kind of stunned and I'm, I'm looking at a uh, full moon setting, full moon setting over the Cascades on good Friday morning, 2019. Oh yeah. Down by uh Redmond, Oregon. Uh, wow. Yeah. <clears throat> In fact, um, I lived within about a quarter mile of that scene. Okay. And so I could just walk onto some BLM land, which is public land. And right. uh, set up uh, on a ridge and uh, catch the uh, sunset, catch the sunrise over the Three Sisters Mountains. And uh, that's one of the most beautiful um, panoramas of, of the Cascade Mountains anywhere, I, I think, in Oregon or Washington. It's really a magnificent setting. Well, we're going to completely shift away from landscapes now. I'm looking at your vehicle photography. What is the story with this Gene Autry bus? <laughs> well, um, <clears throat> that sits. It sits in Palouse, Washington, and um, in the town of Palouse. <laughs> and I was there, just going through town, and I looked at it, and I said, "Oh my God, that is so cool! It is one of his old tour buses that he used." Oh, it really was a Gene Autry tour bus. Yes. Oh my gosh. And I worked for Gene Autry. Uh, he owned KVI Radio at one time for many, many years in Seattle. And so I had to take that picture. Um, uh, it's, it's magnificent. It just sits there. Um, uh, one of the town residents owns it and parked it there. Um, that's about all I know of it, except that, yeah, that's a, that's a real authentic thing. So I'm looking at this bus and it's rusting mm. paint paint is uh, it's been painted several times, obviously through its history, yeah. different yeah. color patterns. But the first thing I noticed that, that just to me just seems very out of place is the pristine instrument cluster. The whole, the whole bus is rusting is you, you know, right. It's rusting. The paint is peeling and you look through the windshield and there is the instrument cluster above the windshield and it's gold and it, the paint looks perfect. So it just seems very yeah. odd to me. <laughs> and that's something I didn't even realize, you know, when I, when I took that picture, um, I was trying to get the grandeur of it and the out uh, look of it, uh, yeah. but I didn't pay much attention to what else was in it. Have you ever been, is it in Washtuckna that has that, the bus that's called that Northwest bus? I've heard of it, but I, and I've been through there, but I haven't, uh, I haven't really discovered it. I, I stopped there one time and, and they had moved it to a, a private parking lot that you can go to. It's a dirt lot. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's an old city transit bus, probably from, I don't know, late sixties, early seventies. It's, you know, yeah. it's, oh, it's newer than this Ginotri bus, yeah. but it's not a new. And there's no glass in it. It's all been removed and it's every square inch of it has been painted creatively. And, um, so I was driving out that way. And so I just, Oh, I should stop and take a look at this just cause I'm aware of it. And there was like 12 people there taking photographs mm -hmm. of that thing. It was, it was the, I, I think there was more people there than there were in the town. Wow. Um, yeah. and I just, I, it's, so this bus kind of in a way jogged that man yeah. for me, but what is it about vehicles that you like? Because you got some, well, like you've got this egg and I farm, the, the international harvester. And I have, um, and that's a, wow, that's a cool shot. Um, why, 
what what do you, what gra- why do you gravitate towards vehicles? History. Um, okay. uh, I think it's a uh, it's a throwback to yesteryear. I think it's a cool look, um, and uh, and I like that sort of thing. It just draws me for whatever reason. But the egg and I. Uh, truck is based upon the novel by Bettig McDonald in Washington State in the 1940s, and her book was called The Egg and I, and it was a wonderful, wonderful novel for its time, and widely read. It became a million seller, and she received oh. accommodation from the governor at the time, and <clears throat> the ranch, the farm was called The Egg and I. Uh, and uh, she and her husband at the time um, established a uh, uh, egg chicken uh, r- farm there. They were from Seattle, and uh, she tells all these stories about um, uh, their trials and tribulations and difficulties of uh, establishing a place on the Olympic Peninsula, and it's humorous uh, in many ways. It's also um, a little bit politically incorrect today. Um, okay. not, not a little bit, but a lot. And the <laughs> okay. way that she references is um, Native Americans, for instance, and so forth. Um, uh, these books also led to the many, many movies that were made in Hollywood um, at the time. And... Uh, uh, very uh, comic uh, uh, movies, uh, Fred McMurray, uh, Pa and Ma Kettle came out of this as well. Pa and oh. Ma Kettle. And there were many movies about um, Pa and Ma Kettle. And there were some <clears throat> lawsuits involved in those as well because people didn't like to be, well, they must be talking about me, uh, neighbors, and uh, so there were a few lawsuits that ensued as well. But oh uh, a very historic, um, uh, big story there. And, and a vehicle represents all that that I took in my picture. Uh, <laughs> See, you ask and you find these great stories. That's what I love about doing this. You know, a simple question mm-hmm. unveils a, a story. I would have had no, no clue on that. Well, then... Next to it is the, my initial question is you've got one called rust in peace, returning to nature, excuse me, returning to nature. Yep. This is a f- car near index. Yep. And I'm looking at this car and it's covered in moss and I can't for the life of me figure out what it is. Do you know? <clears throat> I don't know exactly what kind of a car it is myself. Okay. Uh, I was lucky okay. to find that I was on a mission to head to Leavenworth and I just stopped there. And lo and behold, in the bushes, there was this ancient old car. And I yeah. like the uh, the way the windshield was broken. It's just, you know, looks like a spider web. And, right. uh, and in the rainforest itself. Uh, but I have a whole series of, of vehicles that I found in rainforest situations. And uh, I think that they're just very unique and very interesting uh, one of the vehicles that I, I found was at the Dalles Mountain Ranch down in the Columbia Gorge with a lot of balsam root wildflowers around it. And it's, it's oh, just yeah. a gorgeous setting. Um, mm-hmm. But there's history there, and you have to wonder why uh, and what that car did in its usefulness. Uh, who was it owned by? Uh, where did it drive? Uh, who was in it? Um, right. You know, all those situations and it leaves uh, that to your imagination. We'll probably never know, uh, you no. know, at this stage. Have, have you ever gone up highway 97, um, across in, in, as you're heading up to, uh, Pateros? I've been across highway 97 from Southern Oregon to Canada. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, as you go across the BB bridge in you're winding around before Wells Dam. There's this sweeping curve, and the Columbia will be on your mm-hmm. right. And there's a car stuck in the hillside. And every time I drive by there, I wonder how on earth did that car get there and why? Mm-hmm. <clears throat> it's just like stuck in the side of the hill. It would be a, a wonderful uh, photo op for sure. But with the yeah, right lighting. Yes, with the right light. I never go through at that time of day. But anyway, I just your story here about the, yeah. the Dow's car just sitting there, like, well, yeah, how these are the questions I always ask myself. Like, how did these how did we 
why did they end up here like this and you know and how and and then i'm also looking at your international truck lineup where oh down in the palouse yeah. yeah. And I'm like, yeah, that was at a farm. That's quite that, the uh, I was with a friend at the time and he says, I know these people and uh, she'll allow you to be able to photograph this. And uh, so <laughs> we went there and we got a, she came out with a, a freshly baked muffin, cinnamon muffin. <laughs> and, uh, oh and so uh, I sent that picture to them as a thank you uh, for allowing okay. me to, to photograph it. Uh, it's classic. All those international trucks lined up in a yeah. row with the alfalfa in front or the windrows of the alfalfa in the field. Uh, for me, yeah. it just, uh, you know, hit home. That was that was home for me when I was a kid. And right. So uh, no, that's yeah, that just <laughs> was wonderful opportunity. Well, when you're out exploring Washington. And nobody would know this, but you and I, we are scheduling today got a little mixed up and I'd asked you for five minutes. So I go, go get a cup of coffee. And, and so coffee's coffee's my big thing in life. Got any great little coffee shops that somebody should know about throughout oh, the state gosh. that you've uh, um, stumbled on? You know, um, uh, I, you know, I probably do. Um, <laughs> I, I know, I know a lot of them in Oregon since I spent a lot of my adult life in Oregon. Uh, but there is a cafe, and I forget the name of the cafe, but there's only one cafe in Colfax, Washington. Okay. And um, as you go on the main street, you'll see it. <clears throat> and it's a wonderful coffee shop because, uh, number one, the coffee is good, uh, but the locals hang out there. And uh, so if you want to pick up on local conversation, that's where you go. But in addition to that, their food is unbelievably wonderful. For instance, when you order a hamburger, they grind the steak right there and then make it into a hamburger patty for you. And it is incredibly fresh and well done. Um, is it called the top notch? Uh, yeah. <laughs> I just, I just, I cheat. I looked, and I'm looking at. They've got a photograph of a burger here. That's like, oh, are you kidding yeah, me? Yeah. Oh my gosh, <laughs> that's a great place. Okay, that's a great, All great right. place. Um, you know there there are others. Uh, we have a few here on the Olympic Peninsula. Um, well, like share one. Share one with one us. is Kingston, and it's called the Cup. And okay. uh, it's a sandwich shop. You drive through and you order a sandwich before you get on the ferry. Uh, but their coffee is excellent. It's really, really good. Um, where else? Oh, gosh. There's, a, there's a, a, a small town right before you go into Mount Rainier National Park. Um. And it's on the southeastern corner, Ashford, or uh, I forget the name. Uh, I should know it at the top of my my tongue here. South, okay. Uh, but <clears throat> they also have a great drive-through, uh, coffee shops, and and so forth. So I uh, you pick and choose. Um, you know, uh, early in the morning when I get up to to do some photography, I, I have to make my own coffee because nothing else is open. <laughs> <laughs> see that's why i can't be a photographer <laughs> coffee so I, I just can't go <laughs> oh well as we wrap this up where can people find your photography and um you know just type because we you found us if you will yeah. i mean we found you on facebook yeah. so where where can people find uh, you? just brian with an i jennings photography.com and it's real simple. Okay. You'll find all of my galleries there. I have over 20 galleries that, that I've mm -hmm. compiled. There are probably more coming. And okay. um, I update uh, uh, my web page, oh, at least three or four times a month with something new. Okay. And uh, I've kept it to the best of the best. Um, you know, I could put everything on there, but everything isn't good. <laughs> So, um, you know, I, I have one of my favorite galleries is, is called Showstoppers. And 
I, I try to keep those into the absolute best, most phenomenal shots that I've taken. And it's always hard to determine what goes into that, that gallery. But uh, it's the first one on the site, and you'll see that. And then you go down to different galleries like the Palouse, like, uh, uh, you know, Sunrise, Sunset, Mountains, uh, on and on and on. And uh, you'll see much there. Um, you know, I've also gone to some far-flung places. I have a gallery in there with uh, uh, foreign prints. I have one in there with autumn prints. A lot of them are from uh, uh, Vermont and um, a wonderful place to visit during the fall. Uh, but this year, with my trek to um, uh, the uh, Wyoming area with the Tetons and Yellowstone, I expect to get numerous uh, great fall shots that will go into that gallery. Well, no, so I jokingly say that Oregon is dead to us because we're talking about Washington, and I say that about Idaho or British Columbia, but I'm going to break my rule because I am looking at a photograph here of Multnomah Falls that you took, mm -hmm. and that is stunning. Oh, thank you. That is a thank you. beautiful, beautiful image. I would be better if it was in Washington. Oh, let's just move the falls into Washington State. Um, but absolutely a stunning um, photograph. And, um, yeah, yeah you, you have a wonderful, eye. it's one of my favorites. And, um, the Columbia Gorge is, is, uh, you can spend weeks there and never see it all. And if, if people ask me, where do you go for fall color, uh, in the Northwest, two places, uh, for me, the Columbia Gorge mid October mm -hmm. till about uh, the 10th of uh, November and Leavenworth uh, about October 15th to the 1st of November. And okay. uh, through the um, uh, Tumwater Canyon, Lake Wenatchee area down into Leavenworth is just fabulous. And you have to stop um, and really take a look. But the Columbia Gorge, I love because you have all the waterfalls with those, uh, those beautiful leaves. And uh, every year is different. And uh, both Oregon and Washington sides of the gorge present opportunities. Cape Horn in Washington is fabulous, uh, beautiful vista, looking down into the river and the colors in the in the hills. And then uh, on the uh, Oregon side, of course, you have most of the falls. And uh, Multnomah, of course, is the signature fall. But there are dozens and dozens of others that are just equally as beautiful. So uh, spend some time there and enjoy it because uh, I tell you that when that, when God created the Columbia Gorge, he painted a masterpiece. It is a beautiful area of both, both, both on the Oregon and on the Washington. And you know how the beautiful. gorge was formed? No. Lake Missoula in Montana burst <sighs> okay. and uh, rolled mm -hmm. over the Palouse Hills and then mm -hmm. uh, down into the uh, gorge area, forming the gorge over, you know, tens of thousands of years and at one point uh, portland would be under 400 feet of water and uh, that wow. water went all the way almost to eugene in a lake form and formed the willamette valley so this lake missoula and its glaciers when it burst and it burst dozens of times over you know tens of thousands of years kept flooding through the area forming the columbia gorge so when I think of the Missoula floods, I didn't realize that they went down to the Columbia Gorge. I didn't realize that they went to Eugene. I had just kind of assumed that they, I don't know how far I thought they yeah. went south, to be yeah. very honest with you. Yeah. I mean, to be honest, I'm like, oh, I, I had no idea um, that that was part of the Missoula, uh, the Missoula floods. Yep. And I had no idea that Portland would have been 400 feet underwater. That's kind of amazing. <clears throat> How would you have liked to have been the Native American standing at the glacier that burst with the Missoula flood? <laughs> um, no, no, thank you. Of course, how would you like to have watched the wall of water, say, in Cooley, in Cooley City? Is it hit in all the way there? Yeah. Even yeah. You know, I mean, all of that, all the topography that central Washington has, it's so cool that I've been learning about. Um, there's a professor at central, his name is Nick Sentner. I don't know if you've ever heard of him. 
and he, he had a TV show on PBS and he does a lot of uh, mm -hmm. online YouTube videos and all this. And the man is fascinating. Um, and he was a guest very early on. Oh, our, very cool. Podcast. Yeah, I would love to hear that. And he was just, he's just fascinating. And the one takeaway that of this episode I had with him, um, he was talking about kind of the palette or not um, the enchantments mm -hmm. area. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that rock originated down in Baja, what we know as Baja, California. Wow. wow. And then it worked through. And I'm like, he's, he's saying this and I'm, I'm like, wait, 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 wait a second. Stop. You know, and he goes, Oh, you are listening. And it was, it was like, yes, I am. Listening. And it was just, but the way he described the rock movement through millions of years, that rock originally came down and they're able to test it. Um, and they can see where log mm -hmm. longitudinally and latitude, they can test where the rock originated from. Yeah. Yeah. And so this whole region, this whole, I mean, not just Washington, we're not, you know, I mean, Oregon, California, the whole coastline is just fascinating when you start to think about it. But the idea that rock from Mexico ended all the way up into Canada. Yeah. Yeah. And then we had the Missoula flood coming from the East to the West. Yeah. Yeah, it's just the topography in this area. It's just, it's just yeah. fascinating. <clears throat> and, you know, proves yeah. one thing. There's nothing but change. That's the only constant in the world. And it's still changing, true. you know? Yeah, just, yeah, we, it, yeah, we have to stop. Sometimes we, I think we're all too busy to notice the, the change. Um, but we won't go there. And some of these photographs, I you know, to, if you look at them 400 years from now, they'll be different from, you know, what you see now. Well, I'm looking at one of the Edmonds Ferry Dock right now. It's a sunset photograph. Yeah. And for 400 years, that dock won't be there. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and somebody will look at that photograph and go, huh, I wonder what that big thing was. Yeah. <laughs> why did why'd they use a boat like that? We just take our car. We just fly across yeah, the, exactly. the, the, the water now or whatever it is. You know, I was like, why would that, look at that, how horrible that would have been. It's like, just like we probably look at a covered wagon and go, can you imagine going across the Rockies in a covered right, wagon? Yeah. And, you know, this ferry may, maybe, you know, in 400 years, that's what somebody may look at and go, what? Yeah, exactly why would you right. take that thing? So, well, I thank you so much for making this happen. You're welcome. I've enjoyed myself because I really think what you're doing is your, your art is beautiful. And I love talking about the state and uh, you're, you're obviously an enthusiast of the state and uh, yeah, I just thank you so much for your time. You're very welcome, Scott. I appreciate it. All my best. Join us next time for another episode of the Exploring Washington State podcast.